All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Joe Galbraith. I'm the area coordinator for graphic design. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, if you could mute your cell phones, anything weird like that, make sure they don't make any noise. Uh, we do have another lecture coming up on March 3rd. That's Roberto Lugo, and that is our Dean Distinguished Lecture. So please plan on attending that uh, virtually or in person. Uh, it's an honor to welcome Rick uh, to school today. So Rick Landisberg is the founder and former principal of Landisberg Design, a graphic and communication design firm located in Pittsburgh. His clients have included the Rockefeller Foundation, the United Nations, the Heinz Endowments, the Benedum Foundation, and many other of the nation's leading colleges and universities. His work has been recognized by AIGA, the Art Directors Club, Communication Arts Magazine, Print Magazine, the New York Type Directors Club, the Art Directors Club of Los Angeles, the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, the American Association of Museums, and the University and College Designers Association. Rick has lectured on design issues nationally and abroad and as judge of the Communication Arts Design Annual Competition. For over 15 years, Rick was an adjunct associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University's School of Design. He is a recipient of the prestigious AIGA Fellow Award. A native of Philadelphia, Rick received a BFA in painting from the University of the Arts and also holds a certificate of study from Central St. Martin's College of Art in London. In 2018, Rick stepped away from the Landisberg design when it was acquired. He has since returned to his painting roots. His TEDx talk, Design and Generosity, can be seen on YouTube. Please welcome Rick Landisberg. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, it was, uh, I have to thank Eve Falk. So it, it is great to see you. And it was great when I uh, heard from you a while ago. So um, the, uh, I have to tell you, uh, over the years, I've been down to the school uh, as a visitor uh, to classes and whatnot. It's been a long time. But when I walked in here, I realized that really a long time ago, like an insane amount of time ago, I, uh, a, a colleague, uh, Dan Boyarski from Carnegie Mellon and I, because I was an adjunct at the time, uh, we spoke in this room and we had just gotten back from talking about design in the Soviet Union. It was like the waning days of the Soviet Union and the US government put together this kabunga exhibit on, it was a first rate, gigantic exhibit on American design, like architecture design, uh, graphic design, uh, product design, stuff like that. And while there, they had this seminar and we got to go and we did this three day seminar on design. It was, it was a crazy time. I, we, we loved it, but it, and it was weird and it was heart, kind of heart wrenching. And it was, uh, and we got invited down here to talk about it. And I have to tell you, I was, it was uh, one of those deja vu moments to walk into this uh, room. So let's get uh, moving here. You could hold your laughter until the end, but that is me as uh, a college student. It used to be Philadelphia College of Art, now it's University of the Arts. Uh, and I will tell you, my, uh, my degree is in painting. It is something that I have benefited from every day uh, since graduation. Uh, but in my mid-20s, I fell in love with design, but not as some like painting replacement. It wasn't that kind of deal, but rather it was this uh, other event. I really have always seen like design is not a ver some cut rate version of art. It's different. It is parallel, it's allied, it is not the same, but, uh, a, but certainly a rich uh, endeavor. Um, the um, a, 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 a distinction, and I would commonly say this to students, is artists solve their own problems, designers solve other people's problems, but as we know, it's way easier, easier to solve somebody else's problem than your own problems. Things that are designed exist to do something. 
they solve an articulated problem, whether it's designing an online interface or uh, giving a look to a museum exhibition or uh, designing a pizza box. The, uh, uh, I, I, keep, I always wonder, wouldn't it be great if there was a great pizza box, you know, instead of, you know, the Italian guy going like this? It would be a delight. Nobody would use it, but uh, anyway. You know, it's funny how we take comfort in that, in that expectation. So anyway, so this uh, leads us to this. There we are. I wonder if you uh, know the wonderful designer, Eric Speakerman. He founded Meta Design. He designed the typeface Meta, which is a beautiful face. Uh, uh, and he came up with this line, you could not, not communicate. It's uh, pretty rich, has nice implications. Uh, organizations, places like restaurants, people like me right now, are constantly broadcasting signals about themselves, whether they want to or not. You know, you could not, not communicate. Uh, the job of designers is to attempt to articulate appropriate signals and give them form. One of the tricky things is that designers have to negotiate the process of bringing the project into reality. Uh, whether it's working with uh, creative colleagues or people who help you make that happen, uh, uh, as well as the client. Uh, when I stepped away from my design practice, which is gonna be four years in a couple of weeks, uh, I left with a lot of ideas about how to maximize the chances of making great work. The designer is the person at the center of the creative process. She's the conductor, she's the chef, she's the director. Things sometimes get goofy, some things sometimes go wrong. That comes with the territory. But I have these ideas that I want to put to you, I want to give to you about how to gain the trust of the client and also the people who help you make projects happen. Uh, while I'm mainly thinking about and addressing design, I have to tell you that those of you in the, in other, in the art making uh, fields, you know, painting, sculpture, photography, ceramics, I think a lot of this really can pertain to you in, for, in the future, so especially in terms of situations where you have to answer to somebody. Uh, it might be a public art uh, thing. Uh, it might be a commission. It might be a circumstance where you have to rely on the expertise of others. Uh, so uh, I think some of the things I think <laughs> uh, uh, that I'm gonna say can apply, you could take advantage of right away like tomorrow, and other things you just might want to tuck away for the future. Uh, but I got to tell you, I uh, personally, these are a, a personal uh, uh, strategies and ideas and values. Uh, and uh, so, okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, tell you something else. At various times, I'm going to refer to clients. Uh, what I really... Um, it really means, say, a client in, a, in the way that a design firm might have a client, but it could also be anyone that you as a designer have to uh, answer to. Uh, it might be a, a, a boss, an employer, a supervisor. You know, let's say it's you know, five years from now and you're working for Google or something like that, and you know, there's this big giant setting you know, that's broken up into these little sub-design entities. You know, it might be that person. But I'm going to use the word client because I, I have to use something. The other is I'm occasionally going to refer to my former firm uh, uh, the, uh, 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 as a way of showing examples of work to make various points. And I'm going to say my firm. Well, it's not my firm anymore, even though everybody there, except the person who owns it, who's a wonderful guy, who I, I invited to uh, uh, take over, uh, it's not my firm, but again, I have to refer to it as something. So I'm going to say my firm. So that's uh, okay. Uh, onwards. Um,
so this um, uh, is what my firm ultimately became. I, I built, started and built this firm, and I was there for 35 years, uh, an astonishing number. I have to tell you, uh, seriously, over the years when people would say, wow, that's such a long time, yeah, how'd you make that happen? Honestly, <laughs> the way it feels like inside is like, well, it's what happens when you just keep showing up every day, you know, like sooner or later. So anyway, so uh, the, the firm uh, for many years, it, its initial years, it grew to about like five people. For many, many years, it's been around 10. That's sort of what it is now. Uh, there are people who've worked for me for over 15 years, 20 years. Uh, so there's a huge uh, trust level within the group. Uh, and they're great people. And the various examples of work, these are the people who made that work uh, happen. And, uh, the, uh, and while I was the design director of everything, I sort of totally owned some things. I decided after a, s a certain number of years that I, if I tried to own too many projects personally, they would all go over the budget and be late. It, it just wouldn't get done. But I tried to have my finger in everything. So, so uh, uh, I'm not going to dwell on any of them. I'm going to do this fast so we can get to the real business. Uh, the nature of the work we did, almost all the clients were uh, nonprofits of various sizes, really big, really small. Uh, the, uh, as long as we weren't the nonprofit, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the, uh, 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 there are basically in a set of categories. Uh, for instance, the Carnegie Library Identity Program, which it's a big system. Any, how many people are here from Pittsburgh? A few? All right, they all get A's. The um, uh, uh, Carnegie Library System, 18 libraries, a number of years ago they decided they wanted to really know what it would be like to be, what's it like to, what should a 21st century library be like? It shouldn't be this dusty old uh, uh, place. How do we invigorate this? How do we really serve people in a dynamic way? And we were part of this big team. We did the identity signage. Uh, we're part of figuring out how to make the services accessible and understandable to people who've never hardly been in a library. So, um, uh, like for instance, let, letting people know who's the librarian as opposed to who's the staff. What do you think is the number, I shouldn't be uh, getting off the subject here, but what do you think is the number one question asked of the staff in a library? Raise your hands. Where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? That is, that is the number one question. We try to ease that uh, pressure on the staff. Okay, uh, a big part of my office's practice was designed for colleges and universities. We work for wonderful schools all over the United States. Our oldest and longest term client was Kenyon College in the center of Ohio, a bastion of the liberal arts. Uh, something that came along quite un unexpectedly, the, design, the redesign of college and university magazines. The average alumni magazine in this country is pretty dull. Uh, you know, it's a pretty standard affair. But there's certain schools really wanted to do something invigorating. And uh, by the way, you won't recognize the name Wein the Weinberg College. Weinberg College is the largest college within Northwestern University outside Chicago. It's uh, the College of Arts and Humanities. So uh, design and public spaces. This is the medallion at the point in Pittsburgh where the three rivers come together. They wanted something that said, this is the spot. They also wanted something to, to indicate the beginning of the Great Allegheny Passage, the bike trail that goes from Pittsburgh to Washington, DC. People want that place to say, to have your picture taken, or if they came the other way, to say, we made it. You know, and and this, is, this is a wonderful project that was part of a design plan for the entire Point State Park area. And I was part of that team. It was a very interesting project. Uh, identity, signage. This goes beyond the park. All around the rivers are these tall vertical map signs. 
uh, which is now called Three Rivers Park. And uh, that uh, took a number of years. Very, we, I felt like this project was my graduate school or something like that. It was, so. A um, big part of the firm is work for foundations and philanthropies. In this case, the Heinz Endowments, the Benenham Foundation, which has had a big impact on the state of West Virginia. Um, uh, this photograph by, there's a great West Virginia photographer, uh, Rebecca Kiger, did this shot. Um, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, and then work for the arts. For quite a few years, one of our clients is the oldest flute maker in the United States, Haynes Flute Company. Symphony players all over the world play Haynes flutes, these handmade flutes made in Boston. For about three nights, we had these handmade flutes in my office because they had to be photographed. They were like twenty, thirty thousand dollars each, and I just wanted them out of there. You know, like don't get them out of the office. I don't want to hear. Uh, uh, work for uh, theaters, uh, uh, and also books. In this case, the Carnegie Hero Fund. But we've done a lot of books, including many institutional histories. A lot of beautiful books done in this country that the broader public doesn't see. So anyway. So that's that. Okay. Uh, I think I did that fast enough. The, um, okay. When I was in high school in Philadelphia, growing up in, high, in Philadelphia, I read an article in Philadelphia Magazine. And it was about a local a Philadelphia architect who was really doing a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool thinking in terms of questioning our built environment, questioning assumptions. And he lit on this idea. You know, I remember, I'm like 15 or 16 or something, I'm reading this. And he started talking about light poles. And he was saying, light poles don't light streets. They just light the tops of cars. You know, the, and he was talking about how the real question is, how do you light the street? And not to just make a nicer light pole. The uh, you know that Henry Ford uh, famous line about the uh, you know about the, if uh, if I went around asking people they would just want a faster horse you know so okay it, but questioning those kinds of assumptions um, the uh, uh, I was really taken by this I loved the thinking that this guy was promoting. It's sort of like a, a questioning form. Like if you go up to a lot of people and you say, describe a table. They'll say, well, a flat surface, four legs. And you go, well, what if it has six legs? Is that a table? Let's say it has a base in the middle. Is that a table? You know, it's not what it looks like. It's what it's about. And to ask that question, what are things about, is such a critical question. You have to back up and question those assumptions. So. Uh, the person who wrote that article, th who was interviewed in that article way back when I was a kid, was a guy named Richard Saul Werman. Some of you might recognize his name. He went on to invent the TED Talk. He owned the TED Talks until he sold it for a gajillion dollars. And uh, he uh, was, he, I met him a handful of times. I must tell you, the fifth time I met him, he had no more idea who I was than the first time, even though we have a zillion common connections. And a uh, uh, rascible, uh, opinionated guy, but brilliant. Uh, so uh, he, he, he was the guy who wrote that article. And it, it, it really lit something within me, uh, th th that kind of design thinking. So uh, uh, eventually, uh, and this comes to my first uh, point here, is a friend of mine, if I have a mentor in the world, it's a designer named Joel Katz, brilliant designer. He's now in his 80s. He didn't used to be, I could guarantee that. But he, he said to me, he said, what something is about is not necessarily what it looks like. That's such an important line. Think about the table example. Think about the light pole example. That think about what something is about at the beginning of a project, no matter what that project is. It's a, it is a, a valuable, it's a real keeper, that line. 
Okay. I hope the people that you in this room are know about the designer, the architect Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn, Louis Kahn died in the 1970s. He was one of the great, and some people feel the greatest architect of the 20th century. He was a brilliant architect. He built buildings. You didn't know if they were built last week or if they were built a thousand years, not a thousand years, 500 years ago. A brilliant, brilliant architect who had a rough manner in his speaking voice, sort of like me, he had a Philadelphia accent. And, but what he said was poetic. He would talk about the soul of a brick, a brilliant, poetic uh, speaker, a mesmerizing speaker. And he had a small firm in Philadelphia, which is what, how I knew about him starting as a kid. My dad once sat next to him on a train. <laughs> I got to see him speak at very close quarters when I was in college. He sitting there on a folding chair one day and everybody gathered around. Um, he said, he, he, look at his work. If you want to see someone who is a master of visual acuity, where every, the details are on the money. Um, he said something, a line, which to me was a game changer. And this is what it was about. This, by the way, is the Kimball Art Museum. It's in Fort Worth, Texas. I have never been there. Has anybody here ever been there? I would love to go there. It is a knockout building. He was a master of controlling light a, a, a lyrical architect. So this is what he said. Take this to heart, save this one. A stairway isn't something you order out of a catalog, but an important event in a building. So what's that mean? It's not the stairway isn't a thing, it's an experience. It's an experience, you experience the stairway. And if you extrapolate out from that, it's like designers design experiences. I can't think of an example of what a designer does that isn't an experience, even when it comes down to something like this. Poetry on a page. When you design this page, which I did, <laughs> uh, you, you're designing a form of experience. I encourage you to grasp that idea and hold it close. Designers design experiences, not stuff. Okay, another tale, but once again, a game changer, a huge lesson for me, which I wanna to put to you to, to uh, hold close or to uh, ignore. But uh, this is what it is. My very first project, when I started my own practice, when I went to work for myself. It was in, okay, 1982. Uh, I was 30 years old. Uh, and I, I was living in Pittsburgh. I moved there for romance, and it's still romance. Moved to Pittsburgh, I'd been there two years. I had been freelancing for people while I had, a, I had a job, I worked for a firm, did a lot of corporate stuff. I learned a ton, although I didn't like it that much, but I was learning a lot. And, um, but I would freelance for people back in, in Philadelphia, mainly at my previous job, which is at the University of Pennsylvania Publications Office. So okay, uh, I heard from two women who I used to work with back at Penn. They had become the communications people at Bryn Mawr College, one of the great private colleges in the United States. And they wanted to know if I wanted to apply to, uh, to, to, to uh, bid on the job to redesign their admissions print stuff. Remember, this is a, a pre-digital world. Uh, and I said, if I got that job, I would quit and start to work for myself. Uh, it didn't take a lot of money to start working, to, be a designer, you know, you don't have to buy a lot of stuff. So, uh, so that worked out, that's the background. I went to work on that project and I gave it just everything I had. I felt I, when I went there to present my ideas, I thought I had designed, I had scrutinized every square inch of those pages. Like it was, to me it was perfection itself, I say with all arrogance. And um, 
so this was the cover. Now, this is not, um, we're not holding this up as a design thing here, but a, but a much richer point, and that is this. I'm presenting it to the client. The client was a, a uh, she was a dean of admissions who had been there for generations. She was very smart. She was somewhat intimidating, although she was very fair and a, and a very good person, but I have to admit she, she meant business. And she, um, presenting it, uh, making my case, I'm showing these example pages, and she likes what she sees. She, I'm getting good feedback, I'm getting good signals, you know? And she's looking at these things, and, uh, and uh, when I'm done, she indicates that she really likes it, and I'm feeling great. You know, this is the, my first feedback with this new client in this new uh, direction of my career. And she says, but I have some concerns. And right away, she starts saying, well, the typo on the cover, make it bigger. So <laughs> I'm inside, I'm like, Ugh. she's like telling me what to do. She's like dictating what I'm supposed to do. telling me, make the type bigger and stuff like that. And as you can see, the red type at the top, it's small, and, but it was purposely small. It, uh, it was an indication of almost like institutional self-confidence. We don't have to shout. You know, it's quiet, it's elegant. The whole idea of this was uh, uh, what that school to me was, and to them, was about. This combination of rigor and playfulness. It's like sophisticated, but there's sort of a liveliness too. Not crazy liveliness. Uh, and also a certain spaciousness and stuff like that. So inside, I'm like shaking and I'm thinking, I have to say something really right, right now. I have to come back with something, otherwise this is gonna get out of control. I'm, I could be looking at, you know, a year's worth of just, you know, we gotta straighten things out. And I dug deep, I don't know what she was thinking, but inside I'm thinking hard, and I don't know, somehow I said the right thing. And what I said to her, you know, she said, make the type bigger on the cover. And I said, do you mean that the type on the cover needs more attention? And she says, yes. And I say, well, instead of being bigger, what if it were red? Or what if it was in like a box and had the type was white or something? And she says, sure. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what just happened? And that's the critical moment. What happened here? What happened? What happened was, is I was able to get her to address what she cared about. What she wanted it to be is she wanted the type on the cover to have more attention. She didn't want it to be bigger, but that's what she said. Why? Because that's what she could think of. Now, everybody in this room, you're artists and designers. I bet every one of you could think of four ways, five ways to give it more attention. That's a huge point. It's gigantic. Address what people mean. Address what people care about. Address what it's supposed to achieve. Her wanting the type to have more attention is an absolutely legitimate desire. Absolutely. And so I made it red. And she was happy. Now that was a real micro example. But it applies to anything. It applies. It could, uh, if you're designing signs for a new airport, you know, if you're designing a weather app or something, you know, for some international use, it's the same deal. You want to find out what people mean. Don't get led astray by what they're saying always, but clarify it. So, gigantic. Everything else I'm going to say today isn't that important. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. The sacred contract. When you really strip it down, what's the deal between the client or whoever you're answering to and the designer? Who, and, it, it, you know, what is the core relationship? And this is what it is to me. The client talks about what needs to be achieved in an ideal world. And the designer 
makes recommendations about how to express it, how to, what form it ought to be, what it looks like. That's it. That's the deal. As they, as they say, everything else is commentary. You know, that's the core deal. Now, that is often violated. What to do about that is really hard, and it takes experience. And you know what? I don't care how much experience you have. You could be the most hotshot designer in the world. They all get this. Believe me. I don't care. It could be Paul Rand got this. You know, they, it, it just comes with the territory. It's like you're getting a pickle in a delicatessen. It comes with lunch. And this, but, but ideally, this is that core relationship. It's extremely difficult to talk about with a client. But sometimes there's that trust level. And you could say, this will go smoother if it works like this. But it's gonna, it, it, it takes a lot of uh, experience. And even with experience, there's no key to success. But this is the way it ought to be. This is the standard. Okay. A couple of thoughts on clients. Clients aren't the people that keep you from doing great work. P clients are the people that allow you, that invite you to do great work. Without a client, there's some exceptions to this, but without a client, you don't even have a profession. You have a hobby. You need the client. The client is that person who represents that audience who supposedly needs whatever it is you're designing. You know, that world out there. Uh, there is nothing better than a client who wants you to be at your best. There are clients who uh, don't even think about it. I'll tell you what really stinks is a client who, uh, a situation where you care more about the project than the client does. And I call that the shirker, you know, but it's gonna happen and it will happen. And sometimes you could overcome that. It's hard to do good work for a client who doesn't want it, but you, you, it could be done. You could sneak something past, but you can't do it over and over again. There have been a few and only a handful of circumstances in my career where it got to be too much. And even though a lot of money was on the line and stuff like that, and it's my responsibility to keep people busy in the office, uh, that we, I just had to say, this isn't working. You know? And when you do that, an amazing thing happens. A, a number of times when I really had to do that, and I really suffered over the decision, where I say, hey, we can't, we can't make you happy. You know, this is what we need and you're not doing it. Because at that point you could be real honest because you've already kind of quit. But you know what's happened a number of times? You end up having, they, they respond to it. They don't want this. They, all of a sudden, it's like the fever breaks. And all of a sudden they, they really want to work with you and the dynamic changes. But you never want to do that as some tactic. You've got to mean it. Like you really have to be ready to go out the door and it's, it's quite painful. Um, another thing about clients, almost everybody, everybody, I don't care if you're some big corporate whatever, answers to somebody else. Even the big person at the head of some corporation or something, they're still answering to like a trust board or something, you know, whatever. You know, and a lot of times you have clients who are more concerned about who they work for and their opinion than the people who are the ultimate audience of what you're designing. Because you're not really designing for the client, you're designing for the client's audience. And so, you know, if you're, if you're designing a, uh, what am I saying? Like not a pizza box, but let's say you're designing a new running shoe, whatever. It's not for the person who owns Nike, it's for the people buying the shoes. And and, but a lot of times uh, people get lost and they're so wrapped up in their own uh, little universe that the, the, their fear is of who they work for and the dynamics of their work setting that you have no control over. Uh, and I call that fear-based design. It's not great. It, it, uh, it does happen. 
Uh, everybody deals with it. Everybody. So. The four questions, number six. There's 11 in all. Um, there is a wonderful designer and brand specialist named Alina Wheeler. I, does anybody here know that name? I could imagine maybe not. Uh, I know her from way, way back. I haven't seen her in years, but um, she wrote a really important book. And the book is called Designing Brand Identity. Uh, uh, she's, she's quite brilliant. And she came up with four questions to ask at the beginning of any project. I, I don't think I've come across a project yet that where these questions don't, uh, aren't appropriate. There are four great questions. The first is, as we've spoken, what does it need to achieve? A, a variant on that is who are you? Like let's say you're designing a, a new logo for somebody, a new identity. You know, so it's a little bit of a different question. The question is who are you? Not like what's the name of the company or something like that, but, the, but it's really saying what are you about? You know, what, who, who, what's your, you know, what, why do you exist? Who are you? Or in the question of a particular identified uh, uh, task, what does it need to achieve? So that's question number one. Question number two is, who needs to know? Another way of saying, who's the audience? Who needs to know about this? Who needs to know about you? The third is, why should they care? It's amazing how sometimes clients, they don't have a ready answer for this, which is, uh, raises a flag. And the fourth is, how will they find out? If you, it, before, you don't have to design anything. In fact, you shouldn't design anything until these, you get feedback on this. And to have the answers to these questions, it's, it, 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 it's great to be able to, to have that in your pocket at the very beginning. Now, there are actually several more questions to be asked, but these are these four key questions. The additional questions I'm not gonna get into, it, that would be a whole session. But in essence, what you're asking of the client, and it might even be a room full of people uh, to get feedback. Uh, we've done that a lot. Uh, we would call them discovery sessions. It's the beginning of a project, and they gather all these people around. And there are other questions where what ultimately, you're asking them for adjectives, a handful of adjectives to describe who they are now, who they ought to be in three years, or how are they misperceived, or how is a, let's say you're redesigning something, redesigning an identity or something, you know, how is it we're redesigning, uh, like what well, we've done a lot of magazines, and say, how, how's the university mis misperceived? When you get the answers to that, you take that, you turn that into a, like a mission statement. You're sort of saying, okay, this is what this project's about, this is what we're trying to achieve. But also, you've gotten feedback on what's the vibe, what's the character, what's the spirit of this place or of this the, you know, website or publication, you know, what's, what's, what's it feel like? When you get that, and assuming that the client means it, and we say to them, you've got to mean it. Um, you have a blueprint for how to proceed. Um, I will tell you, when we would do these exercises, sooner or later, I would say 75, 80% of the time, somebody says, cutting edge. And I always say, no, 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 no. Because, you know, I, one a designer I used to know, he used to see, set a great line, he said, Nothing dulls faster than the cutting edge. That by nature, the second you say it, it's out of date. You know, that's why it's the cutting edge. You're, you don't, not only are you not the cutting edge, you don't want to be the cutting edge. Because it's like, you're, it's like saying, we're out of here. <laughs> you know? Curiously, that guy went out of business. Okay. Um, you are not alone. Um, 
I think many times the student experience in design, uh, and it's just, it ought to be like this, is you know it's you, the screen, and some other things. And but uh, except for certain team projects, you're, you're on your own. You're it's part of the the process. But out in the world, especially if you're going to really try things that are new, try things like maybe they're cutting edge. Who knows? But like you are out there making things happen. You know, there's going to be things you want to do, but you don't know how to do it. You know, that you're going to need these other people. Now, uh, uh, there's all kinds of people like this, and we'll talk about that. But I, you need to know that there are all these people out there waiting to help you. They get out of bed in the morning to help you and they're ready to help you. And know that they are there. There are people like these, photographers, illustrators, and printers, writers, technology people, fabricators, web developers, contractors, architects, sign makers, retouchers, all these people with all these expert kinds of expertise. And don't fall into the trap that because you're new and young at this, that you will be rebuffed. I, that, by and large, is absolutely not true. People want to help you because to the extent that they help you, they, it makes their job easier. And, like, and I have to tell you, if I had to go to these people tomorrow, or, or if I was involved in certain projects tomorrow, I, I would always be asking questions. I don't think I went to a printer right and ask questions. You know, like, how do you do this? Well, I want to try this unusual thing. How do you do that? Um, they're ready to help. You know, what you think is that crusty old guy who wants to have nothing to do? No. It, it's, they are ready to help, to assist you, to make good stuff happen. Um, photographers and illustrators are easy to talk about. There are all these great, you know, when you see the work of great photographers, you might see it online, you might see it in a magazine, something like that. You know what? They're waiting for the phone to ring. Now, there's uh, certain elite people who are very expensive, but most, even people who get a lot of national attention, they are there, and they're great people to work with, and they become your creative cohorts. Um, they're, they become your creative, uh, creative collaborators. Um, uh, th th this guy, I, this is for a foundation. This guy was an English guy in Germany. We had to take a photograph for a foundation of the, of the school for autistic kids that this foundation supported in Germany. I didn't know anything about the place. I saw a couple pictures of the campus, you know, stuff like that. But I knew certain things. And I heard about this guy, heard he was good. He spends most of his, car, his time shooting fast cars on test tracks. <laughs> but he had been a photojournalist. And, you know, I talked to him about what the photo was about. I wanted it to be human. I wanted it to be expressive. I said it could be uncommon. It had to be black and white and horizontal. And he came back with the shot. Believe me, I was in no, had I said, listen, I, if I, out of my brain, started dictating a photograph, he could do it. But this would have never happened. It was his idea to put them in a boat. They're un, uh, kids holding an umbrella. They're under a fountain. Yeah, what a great shot. I, I, how could I possibly conjure that? But I talked to him about what the photo should do. And knowing this guy had the expertise, Andrew Yeadon was his name, that he would then contribute what he did. But he gave me a lot of options and stuff like that. But it's great to work with these people. And I've worked with a zillion of them. This photographer has done, she had done years worth of work and continues to do work for National Geographic. Look at that shot. Oh, my God. You know, you know what it takes to have that woman, and believe me, there's nothing posed about this. Look at her heel, right just, just touching that line. Um, look how your eye goes right to, that, to their hands being held against the open space. She's, Lynn Johnson, who took this shot, is a magician. You know, I've hardly ever gone on a photo shoot with these people. You don't need to. And it, it would just get in the way. Like this, this shot wasn't about athletics. This shot was about rigor and concentration and focus. 
for uh, Haverford College. Uh, this woman's grandmother went on a bus for 10 years to get a college degree, and this is her graduation, unposed. You know, here's all these young kids standing around, and she's like glowing, glowing. What a great shot. What a pleasure. This is my very last project ever. A photographer has been White House Press Photographer of the Year. Uh, and again, I, know, I knew what the setting was. I just said, make it lively, make it human, make it expressive. If you look at how this photograph is composed, it's brilliantly composed. You know, look at that guy in the background with his daughter on his back. Look at the, you know, how, how we look through the arms, what's going on. These people are great photographers. What a pleasure. And it, you have to be open to the idea. Allow them to be your collaborator. Now, yes, there are plenty of situations where you know exactly what you want. You find someone to do that. That's different. Um, but all these great collaborators. Like here, see the hands at the top? Like somebody has, photo, people with a photojournalism background, they are sensitive to the story. Their loyalty is to what, your, what the story is of the project. You know, what you don't want are people who are, are taking their own shots. That doesn't work. But the idea that you don't need, like, you don't need the faculty member, you don't need the students in the shot, you don't need anything. All you need are the hands. Illustrators, the same thing. There are all these illustrators that are great. Yes, you might have a particular idea and you find someone to do that, and that's great. But there are all these people out there. Talk to them about what it's about. Talk to them about the thematically and expressively what it's supposed to do. This is the Kenyan Review, one of the great literary magazines. They did the covers for years. And there's another category. There are people who help you technically. Let's say you're a sculptor and you want to do something with structural steel, but you don't know anything about structural steel. There are all these people that will help you make that happen. And they'll get excited. You want them to be excited. In this case, this is these uh, signs around uh, the rivers in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, it isn't just a question of, there's a big leap from what's on my computer to making these things. They have to get built. It's in a flood zone. There's all kinds of junk water floods in the water that's going to bump into it. You can't have the thing get knocked over. What do you do about graffiti? You know, and you have to go out and, and find out how to do this, and people help you do it. So know that all these people are waiting to help you. Oh, it's, and it's so great to get out in the field. This is that medallion. This is like a giant photocopy on, on a very cold, wet day. You know, and we're with the state park people, the trail people, with the people from the office, and just all together figuring it out. Okay, um, it, I should have wrapped it up just now. I'm going to try and say what I have to say. The, the final uh, uh, point, uh, two points, as quickly as I can, so bear with me. I know some of you have to be somewhere. I have opinions on interviewing. When you go out in the world and you're either interviewing for a job, it might be a project, whatever it is, but I, I, well, I haven't been, I've had to be interviewed for projects a million times. I haven't had to interview for jobs too much, but I have interviewed potential employees a lot. So here are my thoughts about inter, uh, des designers being interviewed. Okay. I want to look at my notes so I don't forget anything on the list. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Um, whoops, I went too far. Um, when you're interviewing for a job, please remember something, and that is you are not the only person on the hot seat. Wait, hang on. Uh, Oh, you know what? I skipped something. I'm sorry. Thoughts on presenting. I apologize. Presenting. Whether I, it could be here in school, it could be out in the world. You, are, you have an idea. You're presenting it. Okay. Always say why you're there. You know, start off by saying, this is why I am here. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I hope will be decided by the time we're done. 
uh, it, it, it gets everybody on the same page. And a lot of times, there are people there who don't know why they're there. So always start with that. Okay. Always talk about what you want to do in terms of the audience. The, it could be the client's interest, but it's also the audience. Talk about it in terms of them. It's not about what you want, it's what's right for them. Um, all of us have our own agendas, our own personal expressive agendas. You know, uh, in the case of graphic design, you know, I want to use that typeface one of these days. I love that color combination. I, here's this idea, here's that idea. I want to, you know, do this combination of things. Um, that's great. But that's your agenda. Keep that to yourself and your colleagues. Talk about the client's agenda or whoever you're doing it for. Talk about the agenda of the people who are going to take, whoop, who's going to use this or read it or whatever. Do that. Um, understand, that, keep those agendas separate. Tell the client why they should like it. More importantly, tell the client why their audience should like it. Don't talk about why you like it. It's assumed that you like it. You know, that's assumed. And, and try to all, never defend an idea by saying you like it. Well, I like blue or something like this. Because you know what? They could just say, well, I like green. And that's that. You know, like, then you're done. So uh, it, it, never talk about like it. it. Don't even say the word. Don't even say, I like the weather today. <laughs> you know? Don't use lingo. Don't use technical language to someone who's not going to uh, understand it. It works. You know, car mechanics do it to you and you hate it. Web developers do it and you hate it. You know, like, don't use lingo. Don't use fancy $20 words. It, 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 keep it simple, plain English. Um, as, as, so that's it. OK, now, interviewing. And then we'll be pretty much there. You are not the only person on the hot seat. The person interviewing you is also on the hot seat. You're both on the hot seat. Why are they on the hot seat? Because they have to hire the right person. If they hire the wrong person, they look bad, and it's a problem for where they work. So believe me, you're not the only person. It isn't like you have no power and they have all the power. You both have something going on here. They want to hire the right person. So give them a chance to get to know you, because that's really what they want. This does not account when it comes to human resources people who just ask these formulaic questions, like what would you do if a rattlesnake was in your mailbox, you know, that kind of stuff. Let's forget about that. What you want to do is engage them in conversation. They want to get to know you. They're, they're thinking, what's it going to be like to work with this person? What do they like? Instead of answering this question, that question, don't be a supplicant. Go in there knowing who you're talking to. Know something about the place where you're interviewing. Learn about them. Know what their projects have been. And ask them, be prepared with some sincere questions. Like, hey, I saw that project you did. Like, how did you manage to do that? Or did you have trouble, did the client have trouble, did you have trouble talking the client into that? You know, engage them in conversation. If you see a book on the client's desk, and you know something about it, say, hey, I read that. Or, now, don't lie, you know. But, you know, you, they just want to get to know you. That's it. They just want to get to know you. Give them the chance. Um, OK, thoughts about working. And thank you for your patience. Um, the Great design firms or great design groups, say, within a bigger organization, are made up of people with a lot of different skills. Not everybody is the design hotshot. And you don't want that either. You want a different set of skills. That's what makes for a great office. There's a woman who worked for me for years. She was not great creatively, and she didn't think she was. But she was a brilliant organizer, way better than me, a zillion times better than me. There, there's a lot of projects where somebody has to keep track of stuff and has to be orderly. Like a kind of project that never interested me was like big signage projects like for a hotel or something like that. You know, there's a lot of parts. It's a lot, it requires a lot of organization, a lot of planning and stuff like that. There's a lot of different kinds of skills. Uh, everybody has a different 
like learning preferences and the way they figure things out. You want it to be this wonderful mix. So uh, don't, don't th you know, you want to know what you're good at uh, and what you're not good at, but nobody is expected to be good at everything. You know, it's a, it's, that's why it's a team, because it's this mix of skills. Some people are great writers. Some people are great inventors. They can make, as they say, a dress out of a feed bag. But then there are other people, and I'm more like this, where I open up the refrigerator and say, okay, there's, uh, 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 you know, anchovies and uh, uh, three-day-old meatloaf and, you know, whatever. What can we make for dinner? I'm more like that. I'm more like a gatherer, you know, where other people are like synthesizers. It's a mix. So know that. Know that. Um, uh, and a thing that I kind of want to wrap up with is to me, and this is, this is purely my opinion, there's a set of characteristics that make for great designers and great members of design teams. And this is what they are. And nobody is all of these things. Are, are you trustworthy? Can you be trusted? Not like you're going to steal stuff, but, you know, dependability. Another thing, inquisitiveness. Are you curious? You know, great designers are curious about stuff in the world. Not everything, but a lot of things. Are you flexible? Dependability. Visual acuity. Loyalty to the gang, to the group. The ability to write well and clearly and simply. Cultural literacy, and by that could be a loaded word. It's not meant to be. It's just, you know about stuff in the world. Nobody knows about everything. You know, but like, are, do, you, do you know something about that's more than what you're exactly interested in? Because the cool thing about design is you learn so much about a lot of stuff. You're always getting involved in these projects where you get to learn about stuff that you didn't know anything about. Love of type, that's an easy one. And you know what? The last one is the big one. Generosity. Gen are you generous? I mean, are you generous in spirit? If it's the end of the, you know, the work week, it's like Friday night, you're in the office, assuming there is an office to be in. <laughs> um, you're at the office. You hear, you get it. There's an email, there's a phone, no, a phone call. There's a phone call from a client that you, sorry, that you don't even work with. You know, you, you haven't even met, but a client calls, you're alone. The person says, I was supposed to get this a package by three o'clock. I really need this. I didn't get it. And in that situation, would you have the courage, the generosity to say you're sorry? Start with saying you're sorry. I'm really sorry. Let me figure out what I can do. I don't know about this. I'll figure out what I can. Do you know that you've solved half the problem just by saying that? just by saying, sorry, let me do what I can. But there's a lot of people who don't have that ability to, uh, to be that generous. And then you go to work and you see what you could do to solve the problem. Um, a set, these, are, the, the, these characteristics are, uh, they're important. And, they, and people who possess at least a chunk of these are valued. So, finally, Festina Lente, it's Latin. It was the motto of one of the great uh, uh, Renaissance printer scholars, Aldus Minucius. Uh, remember these people just weren't printing words, they were citing, <clears throat> they were involved in the dangerous idea of the spreading of information. What information in the world is worth spreading? And this was his motto, it means make haste slowly. And his symbol linked to this motto was the dolphin and anchor. The anchor for stability. The dolphin in terms of nimbleness and creativity and responsiveness. And it's that tension of the two. Festina lente, make haste slowly. Which is another way of saying, slow up, you're in a hurry. And that is my benediction. <laughs> that is my wish for you. And my only other piece of advice is this, 
And I, again, I really thank you for being here. And that is, don't work for jerks. <laughs> promise me, will you promise me, please? Thank you. It is six o'clock. Anyone who wants to stick around for a couple of minutes and have a few questions, uh, 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 please. I, I'd, I'd welcome it, I think. All right. Oh, well, man, I must cover a lot of ground. Any questions? I, I will tell you, and for the, the people watching online, it was about the notion of uh, integrity and relationships and work. I will tell you that when I stepped away uh, from, that, from work life, and I've really sort of returned to my painting interests, uh, the, uh, the, the thing that is the richest part of that experience, and I wish for as rich an experience for every one of you, was about those relationships. I really, you, you mix it up with a lot of people and it, it means a, an enormous amount. I once read a long time ago, there's nothing more depressing than looking at old design awards. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's the people that count, I gotta tell you. Yes, please. Have I ever regretted walking away from a job? No, I really mean it, it's happened so rarely. And it was really, I mean, when I've had to do that, it's like, I, you know, like not being able to sleep because it's driving me crazy. And, and so by the time, it's sort of like breaking up with somebody, you always do it too late. <laughs> you know, and and, uh, and it, that's what it's like, You've, you, you know what the deal is but it, it takes a long time because there's a lot of pressure. You know, it, let's say it, it, invariably the projects, that are, there's a lot of money and you know, you have to think about are you being irresponsible to the people in the office and you know, stuff like that. But I can't think of an example where I regretted that. But I have to tell you, it, the, I, these, exa these few times where I did that and they said, no, 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 we will, we do we, 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 we. It, it really changed the game, I, th where they became great clients. I want to make a quick point, very quick. It's something that I thought about saying, but didn't. That is, if you're working on a project, and if you could project yourself so many years down the road, and something goes wrong, let's say it is something printed, and something gets printed and there's a mistake, like a bad mistake, I have to tell you, that happened very, very rarely, almost never, uh, but, but it did happen. And when it did happen, it was usually for some, like nobody, you could totally understand why it happened, but it still happened. And you don't want that call, but you get that call and it's the client and they're saying, this thing got printed, it's a big deal, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and on this page, it's all like goofy. If you think of it, there's, there was like the be something like InDesign style thing where you change something on, it, after it's at the printer, you change something on page 26, but you, it changed something on page 92, you know? And uh, because when it's at the printer, they only check where it was corrected. And to get a call like that, if that ever happens where, you know, something comes up where it's like, uh-oh. No matter what, even though you don't understand how it happened, you don't understand whose fault it is, like 
start by apologizing. You're, like you're not saying, oh, I did it, it's my fault. You're not saying that. What you're saying is, I'm sorry this happened. And the act of saying that, you could end up with a better relationship with that client as a result of how you behave in trying to fix the problem. I've seen that over and over again. It doesn't hurt, you're screwed anyway. You know what I mean? You're already screwed, it doesn't matter how it happened. You know, so you start with that. You're not, by doing so, you're not taking the blame. You're saying, you're expressing compassion because they're crapping, to put it mildly. So, anything else? Okay, I'll be around for a few minutes. Please uh, come down and say hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming to see me.